both church services and hear special music and beautiful song. Thank you, Lana, as always, for singing words that mean something more because they're giving glory to God. Thank you, praise team, worship team. You notice that Dwayne is not here and he is uh, sickly a bit and uh, his wife as well. Make sure you pray for them and others. Oh gosh, wait a minute. Dwayne, Dwayne's up here. He's fine. There's nothing wrong with him. <coughs> but I know that Teresa's not feeling well. A number of people have been uh, going through the, uh, I know what it is. Too much food at Thanksgiving. Yeah. I introduced something in the 9 o'clock service. I want to know how it goes over here with the, uh, this bunch. I was thinking, you know, they've got Thursdays, Thanksgiving, then Friday is, you know, Black Friday, and then they got Saturdays, the small businesses, right? Small businesses. I was thinking that we could shift that to be in small tummy Saturday. Return your tummy back to the size that it once was. You can tell I didn't do that, and I'm thinking that maybe, you know, you sit around Saturday and go, well, it was a good day. We walked around. We did some things and spent some time with the family and go, oh, everybody sits down and takes a little bit of a nap. But uh, thankful for the Thanksgiving weekend, the Thanksgiving week. Our, our staff gave them a couple uh, extra days to hang out, and we had uh, a good time with my family, my sister was the oldest child came in from California, and so that was good. Uh, she was uh, just really just thrilled by the idea that gas here is less than three dollars a gallon, and in California it's a lot more. But uh, but yeah, um, there's lots to be praying for and making sure. By the way, how's Rhett doing? Really good. There's uh, again. This time of the year, there's flu and colds and things like that, so we'll be praying for one another, lifting each other up. We're back to our series on Love Never Fails. Go over to chapter number 8 in uh, 1 Corinthians, and we're going to keep on plowing along. We have had, again, last week was Thank You Sunday. This week is, uh, and the week before that was Ministry Appreciation Sunday. Here we are with our 47th Sunday, 47, 48, and... Uh, this, this plus four more, and the year is gone. Don't want to rush things, but 2022 will be gone before you know it, and it's hard to believe. But we have uh, a reminder, of course, as well, December 11th on that Sunday, which is two Sundays from today. Uh, our uh, Christmas uh, production, our mini production will be here in both services. Make sure that uh, if there was a time or a place that someone you know would like to go to church, but often doesn't come on a Christmas time. Uh, that'll be the Saturday, uh, Sunday that we do that. The 18th, of course, will be a, a family time and uh, just before Christmas. And then we do not have any services on Sunday, the 25th, on Christmas Day. But we have Christmas Eve. And we're gonna have a big Christmas Eve service on uh, on Saturday, the 24th, of course, at 5:30. Make sure that you take the time to set it apart, set it away now so that you can be here and be a part of it. Uh, it should be a, a wonderful celebration. Um, we're thinking that uh, we could take it all the way to midnight and then usher in Christmas. Uh, no, we won't do that. I know that people love to do things with their family on Christmas Eve, so we'll have a, a sweet and short time uh, together in communion with the Lord and with one another, and, and you'll go off to do the things that you love to do with your family and then wake up on Christmas morning on Sunday and, and enjoy that as well. So... We're thankful to the Lord. As we've been through our series, and you see up there, Love Never Fails, we're reminded of the background here, that in uh, uh, Corinth, there was a church that was started, and after it was started on the second missionary journey of Paul the Apostle, and he is uh, going through there, this church is started, and then, of course, there's Aquila, Priscilla, and a lot of other things that are going on here. Uh, of course, the beginning of the, of the letter, the, uh, the beginning of the epistle speaks of, I am of Paul. I'm of Paulos, I'm of Cephas, and they had some divisional things. They had some doctrinal issues. They had many things going on. A great deal of the mistakes that could possibly happen in a, ch happen in a church are covered in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians. In fact, 2 Corinthians, there is 
uh, an accounting of the last three chapters, four chapters, where you see that there is a repentance in the church and there is some things that have turned around, but the first nine chapters of 2 Corinthians reveal to us, and it's been said by some scholars, some theological people, that was, you know, two different pieces to one whole letter, but what we have is the Word of God, and I just take it that way, that it was all the chapters of 2 Corinthians, but the first nine are pretty tough, pretty scathing, because this church had a difficult time with carrying out God's plan for them, God's path for them, God's way for them. And they had another issue come up in the beginning of chapter number 8, and it goes back to this letter that is referenced that they uh, wrote to Paul and said, Hey, Paul, over in Ephesus, we need your help. The church has been doing okay, but now we've fallen by the wayside. We've grown. We, we, we've reached some people. But we've got doctrinal issues. We have questionable practices. And if you think about questionable practices and act, uh, actions in anybody's life, and of course, in a church, in a business, in a family, you wonder what kind of principles there are. Because usually questionable principles lead to questionable practices. And after, again, we are uh, in this season of the year and saying thank you to the Lord and appreciation Sunday, and all that God has done, everything, and, and be still and know that you are God and, and thank you for everything. And remember all that you've done. We come back to the Word of God and we're reminded of the same thing that can happen to any of us. And all those good things that are going on and all the things that thank you, God, and, and praise God and, and giving thanksgiving, we hit a, another place in the Scriptures where it's a warning, where there's challenges, where there's great teaching on, hey, if something comes up that needs to be sorted out, what does God want us to do? Well, chapter 8 brings us another problem. It's not uncommon to the early church, and it can be applied to us today. Law, liberty, legalism, license. That's what we're going to cover in chapter number 8 a little bit. There's 13 verses. We'll cover all of them today. And again, it goes back to these questionable principles that they possibly, you know, they had to have in order for them to have these questionable practices, their actions, the things that are going on, and how do they deal with that. And, and, and really, guys, when you think of any church, if you get away from the Word of God, if you get away from what God has set out for the church, then you can just put out any principle or any thought or any doctrine that you want, and when someone gives you the opinion of themselves instead of what the Word of God says, thus saith the Lord, now you're going to have a difficulty. Chapter 8 is, again, bringing us a problem. Now, keep in mind, as we read it here in a few minutes, there's really not a actual parallel to, of this problem to today, meaning there's uh, nobody in Corinth here of Blue Springs that is sacrificing animals and making sacrifices to false gods and idols and being saved out of that. But we have been saved out of a lot of messy things, and what the whole context of the beginning of this chapter is, is that, hey, you Corinthian people have all these gods, all these idols, and you bring these sacrifices to them. You bring them and they're burnt on the altar by the priest to that, that, that idol. And then some of that meat is given back to that person or some of it's sold at the market. And now, now, people that are born again, people that are new Christians and, and they're, they're, they're going to people's houses and say, well, where would you get this meat? Well, it's, it's the leftovers from the Idol worshiping sacrifice that I had. Whoa, 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 you can't do that. So here we are dealing with a real live situation here because, again, the young believer, the immature believer, is saying, hey, everything is bad that I was partaking of when I was lost. I remember, and I've said this before, when I got saved, I came to Christ in 1983, I thought, it's time to quit baseball. I've got to quit it because baseball is the reason why I sin. I did. I was serious about it. I said, oh, gosh, it's so evil and wicked, and it's the baseball life, and so i got to walk away. And, of course, I had to have some wisdom from other believers saying, and this is part of this, hey, you're young in the Lord. It's a matter of your heart. It's a matter of you not knowing the Word of God. God's given you a conscience to learn. The Holy Spirit now is born, and you're born again. You need to get into the Word of God and understand that it's you inside that are defiled not the outside things. 
that are hitting you from the outside in. And so that's the context, and that's what's going on historically in this church at Corinth going into chapter 8. So just what does it mean to be free once you're saved? You're born again, you're saved, you're free in Christ. How far does Christian freedom go in regard to behavior not specifically forbidden in Scripture? You say, well, we've done a study in, in Galatians. Well, that was a couple years ago. There's nothing wrong with coming back to the Word, and it's similarly put before us, but not... When you, when you see that the Word of God repeats things, you've got to believe that it's really important. It's not something to just go, well, yeah, I guess, you know, we already covered that in some other letter, and this is pretty important. And God is showing us in His Word what it means to be free. And how far does Christian freedom go? We need to answer these questions today. Between 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, these three chapters bring out a great deal of principles of balance that must come upon the, behavior, uh, on the believer, on Christians, on how to deal with matters. And one of the big ones today we're going to look at is how that knowledge and love come, apart, come, come uh, to a place of balance. It says in Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 1, many of you, of course, know this verse, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Listen, oftentimes when we see verses like that, we say, okay, well, I got that. Well, if you're a young believer in Christ and you get that, you say, okay, I can kind of, I guess, oh, I got liberty in Christ, uh, I'm born again, I, I'm sealed to the day of redemption, there's spiritual circumcision in my life, I'm not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, why am I getting tangled up with sin again? Well, we have to look into the Word of God and find that, because when you're born again, when you get saved, and all of you here that are saved, truly saved today, you know you're free from the bondage of sin, and yet the sins of the flesh come back. The gospel of Jesus Christ, unfiltered. And not watered down, but purely says, Jesus came and lived a sinless life. He died a cruel death on the tree. He shed his blood for you and me, a perfect sacrifice for God to assuage his wrath. He rose on the third day according to the scriptures. When you believe on that, that gospel sets you free. So now, brethren, verse number 13 of chapter 5, it says, You have been called into liberty. Use not that liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So now, I stand fast in that liberty that I'm saved and born again. I now say, okay, I've been called into liberty. And if you continue in chapter number 5 of Galatians, you realize he really goes after something important. Which is that you and I are new creatures. We have the Holy Spirit of God in us. We have this spirit of freedom in Christ. The spirit of the living God in us. There's fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. It goes in and through all of that and say, hey, I can live this life completely bought into what the Holy Spirit's going to do. He's going to control my life. Well, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 what he really can do. It says in verse number 16, and then I'll read 17. It's up on the screen. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face beholding as a glass of the glory of, uh, glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You're new in Christ now, and you will be changed one day when you get to glory, and you can be completely in the presence of the Lord and completely brand new. Right now, you and I, again, as I said earlier, have this new life. So think of the people at Corinth. Think of the Corinthian church. New believers, young, some of them, old, older, some of them, some of them young in their maturity, some older in their maturity. They have knowledge. They know things, the scripture tells us. They have lots of knowledge, and yet they're having a tough time really grasping the principles and the practices of what it means to handle this liberty in Christ. They go back to law and legalism. Then go back to this license I had to do whatever I want. And back and forth we go. And there's a balance here to be found. You see, possessing a proper and biblical balance is the key. It would seem that when it comes to many issues, human beings are inclined 
to pursue extremes. Are you that way? Are some of you that way? I've got to fix something in my life. I'm going 100% the other way. I've got to lose 30, 40 pounds by January 10th. I'm going to lose it all. Like in one week. That's, isn't that a little extreme? I hope I can lose 20 pounds in the next 20 years, maybe a pound a year. Is that? Now that's the other side of not doing anything. But that's another extreme. You'll go extreme one way or you go extreme the other to find a solution to something. We're drawn to that. And the scripture's teaching us, look, possessing a proper and biblical balance is the key. Not your balance, but God's balance. Hey, there is certain things that are in the word of God and there's certain things that are not in the word of God. So what's going to be my approach to them? It would seem that when it comes to many issues, human beings are inclined to pursue the extremes. And so when it comes to knowledge, ha, I'll just take care of it with my great knowledge. When it comes to love, I'll, I'll take care of it with my great love. And it has to be a balance between the two. Again, when it comes to love never fails, Paul is saying, look, I'm teaching you the principles of the Lord. I'm teaching you his commands. I'm teaching you his covenants. I'm teaching you the way that the church is supposed to operate. I'm telling you that you're the bride of Christ. I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit of God is in you as the temple. You are the temple housing him. You are the temple of God, not physically as a church building, but church corporately where the temple of God. Flee fornication. Get away from that stuff. Do marriage right. Do everything right in the Lord. And when things come up, we'll deal with them. And some of them have come up. Let me do this real quick, and then we'll get into all the rest of our introduction, and then read the scripture. Think of this. If I'm at the end of this message here in a few moments, and I gave you a summarization of things, you say, okay, yeah, I can remember that. But I'm going to read you the summarization real quick right now, and then... I'll read it again at the end and see if we were able to walk through this passage of Scripture in that way and in our summary see that these things came out. First one in my summation here. When we accepted Christ as our Savior, we were set free. How far does Christian freedom go in regard to behavior not specifically forbidden in Scripture? A second piece of our summation. Knowledge must be balanced by love. Satan uses dogmatism in questionable things. You know why he does it? To separate Christian believers and sow seeds of discord and dissension in local churches. A third summation. Before the exercise, we exercise our Christian liberty, it is our mature Christian's responsibility to ask ourselves, how will this affect other people? Okay, we'll get there on this one. A couple more. Someone who is really knowledgeable, knowledgeable in the Word of God, realizes how little he knows. Arrogance is a sign of ignorance. And then one more summation of our message today. Biblical truth and wisdom, excuse me, and the wisdom to personally apply it in relationships with other comes from a Christian acting in two ways. Conceptual, conceptually. Here's the concept of things, I see them. And then relationally, how is it going to affect relationships? Love is the medium by which we get things done when we have this knowledge of God on how to do things. When it comes to love never fails, we as believers really need to grasp these type of things come up all the time, and we just can't say, ah, eh, the Bible says something but not everything, so I just, I'm just going to wing it and flip it. As mature believers, we should look into the Word of God and see the principles, and then practice the right practices in order for us to say, okay, 
God is honored and glorified and he be pleased. You see, the truth is that all believers are not in the same place in their faith walk. The mature, the immature. I share this often. It's one of those top four or five biggest burdens of my heart as your shepherd is that I love to see more mature believers come alongside of the younger, immature believers. And not younger maybe just by age. Just that they are less mature in the word spiritually. We are all in, the very, in various degrees of growth in our spiritual maturity, all of you. Some of you just spent time listening to a Bible study in Daniel with a tremendous Bible teacher. That's high-level stuff. Now, if I asked a question or two this morning, how many of you could recall the lesson in Daniel and tell me some things that you learned this morning in Daniel? Would you raise your hand? Okay, the pressure's on for $100. No, I'm just kidding. That's good. So you're attentive. You're a mature believer. You're taking notes. You're saying, and even if you don't take the notes, you're saying, okay, I grasped something. What are you going to do with it? The immature believer that doesn't receive those things, or they need more time to receive them. Year after year after year, we say it all the, all the time. you got to stay with it. you got to stay with it. Our central theme then for today in our message is from chapter number 8, of course, and verse number 9. It says it up in the screen. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. That is our central theme today because that's where we're headed. So how important is it for us to realize that the higher principle of our liberty in Christ is not to become a stumbling block to the weaker believer. That's our central theme today. It's so important. How important? It should be one of the paramount things that you think about as a believer in Christ. And if you are a weaker believer less mature in the Word of God, that's fine. Then you need to go after being more mature. You need to learn more of God's complete purpose and path for your life. We say verses like, Trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not unto thy own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. How in the world would I know what path he's directed me on if I have never heard his voice? Or I barely listen to his voice when I open up the Bible. You see, it's important. Now we're going with a deeper principle today of, hey, mature believers. There's a higher principle here in play. That our liberty in Christ has not become, does not become a stumbling block to the weaker believer. Thus the title of our message, Balance Stops Stumbling. Balance. Balance in the Lord. Balance in His Word. Balance in principles of His Scripture. That's what Paul is teaching us in these 13 verses. Again, as we read this now, you think, how many legs of lamb, roast beasts, or even turkeys were sacrificed unto a false god before you got your hands on it. I don't know. Maybe it's so. Maybe not at Price Chopper. I don't know. No, this is something that goes deeper than that. The Corinthian people are born again out of a culture that sacrifices animals to idols. What do I do to deal with that? Think of all the things that you can right now, of things that are in your life or around your life, forgive me, that were in your life when you were lost before you got saved. They're still there. How do they affect you? Do you go to church services at the old church that you used to go to? Will you go there? I rejected the idea of being my niece's godfather in the Catholic religion because I thought it was wrong to do it. I was a young believer. 
You know, to this day, I regret that. But it, on the other side of it, I did not have the maturity, spiritually speaking. And I, in my mind, thought it would be the wrong thing to do, to eat that meat, to take part in that. In my place there, I'd only been saved six years. You see, when we get into this today, I want you to think for yourself, what are those things that have been around my life? Now I'm born again, I've been saved for a number of years, maybe a short time, long time. What are those things that affect you and go, wow, I, ha I know I have liberty, but whew, I can't handle that. Chapter number 8, 1 Corinthians, here we go, all 13 verses. We'll make our prayer and I'll give you three short little lesson points about what it means to see balance stopping the stumbling. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. I know that many quote that. Just remember, there's a lot of context here. Let's continue. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. We could all agree on that. Great deity verses coming up here. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there be gods many and lords many, verse 6, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Bam. Bible proof. Deity of Jesus Christ, of God. Verse 7, it continues. Howbeit there is not every man and every man that knowledge. <laughs> Why doesn't every man have that knowledge? For some, with conscience of the idol unto this hour, eat it as, they, as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Here's our key verse. Verse 9 says, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at, table, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Verse number 12 and 13. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. That's a pretty high bar and a high standard by the word of God to not be a stumbling block. Now, Father in heaven, we come to you again in prayer. And uh, a lot of prayer this morning on this message because I wanted to convey what you would have it to, to convey by your Holy Spirit. So in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will lead and direct our study, our preaching, and our teaching, and everything, all of it, uh, will give you glory and honor, that you will bring your glory into this gathering as we commune in you and over your word. And I, I pray for every individual here that they will take something, whatever state they're in for their, their walk, their... their uh, their faith walk. They may be spiritually weak, may be spiritually strong, or somewhere in between. I just pray you would come and deliver as only you can exactly what they need from our word time this morning. We ask all these things and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, back to the, the title again. Balance stops the stumbling. The balance in this setting is so very, very important. Quick highlights, you see that in the reading of the Scripture, and we'll break it down here in a moment, they're told that they have knowledge, and then it's said, if you don't have it, you ought to have it. 
So on the one end, you have a group of people as a church who are failing in their practices and somewhere in their principles of knowing what God would have from them, from his word and from this word right here as the letter is being written to them. To the extent that they continued in a behavioral pattern as a church, and that's to say everyone, but that the things are pointed out continually. After going through marriage and fornication again and, and all that stuff that he did and the spirit of God and, and everything. And we're about to get into some more things when it comes to chapter number 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. 12 and 14 with the spiritual gifts. 13, of course, as we've already kind of scanned over the love chapter, the charity that never fails chapter. We realize there is an important principle to balance. And it's not my balance, and it's not your balance. It's God giving us scripture to balance things accordingly on how we deal with particular things. When it comes to liberty in Christ, we need to have balance. When it comes to the law, we need to have balance because Christ did fulfill all the law. It is by grace and truth that we were saved and born again. And Jesus says, hey... The law came by Moses, but grace and truth by the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that in John 1. But when we stop here for a moment, and I, I just like to read you something that comes from some notes that I, I have here. It says, uh, and I'll just kind of summarize this, but it's, it says something like this when it comes to the particular issues we're dealing with in the church at Corinth, and they could apply, of course, to all of our churches. The greatest hindrance to any church is not the insensate outside attacks of sin, secularism, humanism, materialism. The greatest hindrance to any church is strife, division, and controversy from within. Just ask Nehemiah. Ask Moses. Ask Paul. Ask any of the pastors here. Ask Timothy. For the letters that you read that were directed by Paul to Timothy and to Titus, you realize those pastoral epistles are loaded with great counsel and great advice on how to handle stuff like this. Strife, division, controversy. This is one reason why Paul encouraged the Ephesians to, keep, to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in bond of peace. Ephesians chapter number 4. It is historically true that persecution from without only serves to strengthen the church body. Although there are certain individuals that may fold under pressure... In his division, discord, discontentment, pride, and arrogance within that destroys a local church and its effectiveness. The Corinthian church was in danger of destruction from within. These are the matters that are before us. And each one of them, each chapter, the Corinthian church made it for a while. But if you, of course, turn to Revelation 2 and 3, you find a lot of churches that fell, a lot of churches that failed. And here I am as the pastor of First Bible, to me the best church ever, not because of me, but because of you, and thanking the Lord for making this the church that he has made it, thinking, no, I'm not boasting on anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and saying, Lord, I want it continuing. I want that type of church thought and process and teaching that you have given us by Paul the Apostle to continue to grow deeper in us that more mature believers will get a handle on really getting alongside of the immature believers and saying we need to grow together. Mature believers realize though that their liberty deepens over years of growth and grace and truth. Do you not say that? You mature believers here today? It restrains their conduct in the love of Christ. That's what I see in the first three verses. Mature believers realize their liberty deepens over years of growth in grace and truth. Some of you have been saved for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 5, 10 years. You've grown and you've grown and say, yeah, I understand liberty more and more. I understand how I'm free from the sin and the bondage of the sin. If you're lost this morning and you don't know, how, don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you've never called on the name of the Lord to save you. You don't understand what it means to be free from sin. You don't know what the cross did for you because you've never called on the name of the Lord to save you. 
The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so any man should boast. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you become a new creature, the bondage of the sin that was going to send you to hell is gone. And now you have this liberty up there. The liberty in Christ. And now it begins in your walk with him. And it deepens over the years if you grow in the grace and truth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it also restrains your conduct. If your conduct is not restrained, then maybe it's time to be a little bit more mature in the Lord. Because that's what's being covered in these first three verses. Touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Hey, we know what we should do and know what we shouldn't do. We know all about those uh, sacrifices and that meat that's been given up as an offering to the idols. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. What am I supposed to do with all this knowledge? Well, it's often said that charity or love really, really deepens someone's faith and deepens their testimony and grows them in incredible ways. But of course, knowledge just makes people swell up. They actually get a, <laughs> an allergy to knowledge and they become swollen up and they're sick over too much knowledge without charity. Knowledge is incredible. Keep on going after it. Knowledge is, is greater and great knowledge is awesome. It's an incredible tool to build people up, but it can be a weapon to fight and to take down people. It says in verse 2, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, <laughs> yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Will that be said of people more than just the people in the Corinthian church? It is said that logic can solve an awful lot of problems. Many of you are solution finders. You solve problems for a living. But in the body of Christ and spiritual matters, logic does not always solve every problem. Especially when it comes to relational problems and connectivity problems and deepening problems and knowing the word of God and deepening problems when it comes to doctrine. You see, hey, let me just give you a simple example. You should not do this and you should not do that because if you do that, huh, you're going to get in trouble and someone's going to sit there and go, well, that sounds great to you. Well, no, I'll give you a Bible verse all about it. To him to know it, to do good and do it, to not it is sin. Stop sinning. Okay, that's fine. Be ye kind one to another, tender heart, and forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And we give these logical answers, and those are great. But without love, they're just going to sit on the shelf of the person that you delivered them to, and they're not going to grab them off the shelf. We know knowledge. Just like the Corinthian people says, we know knowledge. Balance, now believers, mature believers, it develops principles for teaching truth with love. Balance develops principles for teaching truth with love. It's God's way. God so loved the world. God proved his incredible knowledge of the universe of himself by showing you his love. God has proven out completely the truth of this. How does he communicate who he is? What he's about? His knowledge, understanding, his wisdom... He sent his son in love. Jesus Christ is the connecting point of love. The Bible says God is love. Knowledge alone is dangerous. Love alone is dangerous. Knowledge alone can lead you to a place of Pharisaicism. Love alone can lead you to a place where there's hypocrisy without doctrine in solid biblical truth. We know knowledge. Balance develops principles for teaching truth with love. It says there, 
If any man love God, the same is known of him. Someone teaching me Bible truth that loves God, I'll receive from that person a whole lot more and a whole lot deeper things. Remember what I said in the, the slide before. When you have your liberty deepened over years, it restrains your conduct in the love of Christ. The second piece that I see in verses 4 through 7 is that overwhelmed believers. First of all, I was talking about mature believers. Overwhelmed believers. They battle their past sin and idolatrous life. It resounds over time that there is victory over those fleshly sins in the love of Christ. I'm sure you see a pattern there. In the love of Christ. This is what Paul is conveying in his love. He's saying, I understand what you are walking through. I was a Jew, a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day of the, of the teaching of Gamaliel. He was it. I consented for people to be murdered, and now I'm giving you teaching. That as an overwhelmed believer, you're going to battle your past sins and your idolatrous life. What are the false idols? What are the icons of life? And you say, okay, I've had to grow past those. Go back 20 years, 25, 30 years of your walk with the Lord. Think of how many things God shed for you and God got rid of you, got rid of things for you. But look in verse 4 and 5 and 6. You see, as concerning therefore the eating of the things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. And that there's none other God but one. Paul saying this to the mature believers. Oh yeah, I got gotcha. you. And the new believers saying, yes, I believed in Jesus so there's no other. Yeah, I got that. But now I see this conflict in me that people are still messing around with the meat that comes from the idols. They're eating that. And he's saying in verse number 5, though there be that there are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, there's lots of gods around. They're everywhere. He said, hey, look, there is but one God, the Father whom all things are with it, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. Why is it that there is not in every man that knowledge what it is? Because their conscience, it says in Romans 3, tells us that the conscience of man knows that God exists. Paul's saying, hey, it resounds over time that there is victory over these fleshly sins in the love of Christ. Hey, we know idolatry. Many of you know idolatry? I'm not going to spend any time here. You know your idols. That's you. I know mine. That I have to work through to push them aside so that I can worship the only true God all the time. We know idolatry. Balance forms understanding for those young in the Lord. I will have you consider this, people that have been saved for a long time, grown in the word. You've been discipled, you've been a Bible teacher, you've had small groups, you've discipled other people, or again, you have been discipled, or you've taken Bible Institute courses and things like that. You say, yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't have idol problems. I, maybe your idol is just yourself that you need to put down. Because balance forms understanding for those young in the Lord. And when you don't recognize those idols in your life, and I don't recognize the idols in my life, then they get in the way. And what Paul the Apostle is telling this church is this. Yes, there's one God. I agree. There's one Lord Jesus Christ. I agree. They're in him and by him, so they are one and the same. That's deity. Hey, family members, with your religious stuff going on in your life, you have certain things that you hold to more than any other thing in church culture. And remember... The sins of the flesh of your past will be a constant battle. And especially for those weaker, immature Christians. Why can't I stop this? Why can't I stop that young believer from doing that? Why can't I stop that older believer from doing that? Why won't they just stop doing what they're doing? And Paul's saying, look. 
There has to be a balance on how the delivery goes to put before them the principles of God's word. And it includes, big time, the love of Jesus Christ. People do not receive well your words of condemnation or your words of exhortation or your tips of life and advice by Jesus or by God's word without you pouring in a little bit of love. I just want you to know that. I receive things a whole lot better when you bring a little bit of love of Jesus Christ. And in my own personal experience, I know that around here as well as anything, and in my home, even worse. I just think I'm right to be right because I just said a Bible verse. But balance forms understanding for those young in the Lord. You're not pridefully above them and arrogant over them to say, I know more than you. <laughs> it's, I'm thankful that God has shown me things by his grace and his love. And now may I come to you and tell you that I know an idol does not mean anything. Yet not all believers are mature in their knowledge and understanding of spiritual truth. Even when baby Christians do understand that there is one God, the God of the Bible, their recent experiences in the world still come in. They trigger them. They pop into things and go, ah, I'm just going to have to get rid of everything. I'm going to move to a cave. I can't do anything right. I'm just a sinful, rotten person. And we forget that the Word of God is the answer here. That The Spirit of God can mature us. You see, that fresh old sin in the Corinthian church, believers that are newly saved was right in front of them, just like many here in our own community. And lastly, keep in mind the immature believer. I spoke about overwhelmed believers and mature believers, now immature believers. They maximize their growth and maturity through commitment to the Word of God. You say, you bring that up a lot, Pastor. Yes, I do. I do. If you're not mature in the Lord, in your faith, it's not that this church did not put up enough teachers in front of you. It's not that you didn't get enough options on how to learn the Word of God or learn how to walk. Yes, we have many failures on our part, yes. But please, you and I know that immature believers can maximize their growth. You can maximize your growth and maturity through a commitment to the Word of God. It speaks to their conscience in the love of Christ. You say the Spirit of God, yes, but the conscience as well. The word conscience means to know with. To know with. A deeper meaning from the concordance says to distinguish between what is morally good and morally bad, prompting you to do the former and shun the latter. Distinguish between what is morally good and what is morally bad. To know with. Conscience appears 32 times in the New Testament. It must be pretty important. Some Christians have weak consciences because they've only been saved for a short time or they haven't grown a lot. I will say as we finish this up and look at this and look at these verses that our last point is kind of fun, but in the meantime, it also points right to the Scripture. It says that we know knowledge, we know idols, we also know food. Do you know food? But food in the Word of God is neutral. See, balance accepts responsibility, in this case, and in most cases, for modeling liberty properly. Model liberty properly. I remember when I first got saved, there was, you throw away everything that was of the devil. What is that list? Well, do you guys ever have any book burnings, any, you know, Cassette tapes, records, all that stuff, remember? Yeah. You guys just smiling, you lost about a couple thousand dollars of your music collection. We know food. Balance accepts responsibility. Balance accepts responsibility. Balance between knowledge and charity. Knowledge and love. For modeling liberty properly. 
neither eating or drinking the right thing or the wrong thing is going to get you closer to God. Well, I just need to eat the right foods in order to get closer to God. That's not what the scripture teaches. Mark 7, also in Matthew, we, are, we find out that the things that defile us are the things that come out of him. Mark 7, 15. The things which come out of him, those are the things that, excuse me, those are they that defile the man. It goes into the key verse, of course, of verse 9 and goes into verse 12. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. He goes in and speaks of the conscience. He goes again and continues in verse number 11. Watch this in verse 12 and I'll finish up. Look at this. Verse number 13. This is a pretty tall order. I mentioned it earlier when I read it. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. When you do things that go against a brother who's weaker in their faith, in their walk, in their maturity, immaturity, you so sin against Christ. Well, I can do what I want. There's a lot of areas in which you and I can sin, and this is a big one. Verse 13, this is how you overcome it. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the, word stand, while the world standeth. That means forever, until the world doesn't stand anymore, lest I make my brother to offend. That means that I'll go to any length, any length, because God says, hey, I can mess with your conscience in a good way by having you read what I think, and then you can think what you read of me. You see, carrying a balance between love and knowledge for the brethren stops us being a stumbling block. As I finish up, let me remind you of two things that were in my summation that I read earlier. For sake of time, I'll just read two. One who is really knowledgeable realizes how little he knows. Arrogance is a sign of ignorance. We have found that out. And secondly, the truly well-rounded Christian acts in two ways, conceptually and relationally. And they have the ability to understand biblical truth and the wisdom it takes personally to apply it in relationships with others. Love is the medium through which knowledge is Parents know that better than anything else. If you want your child to not stick their finger in a light socket, you ought to do it with a little bit of love or they're going to prove to you how much they love light sockets. Our prayer time today is this. Lord, what needs to happen in my life for me to mature and grow up I need to grow up. All of us need to grow up. All of us need to know that maturity in the Lord can really help us to understand our liberty in Jesus Christ and how to convey knowledge with love. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our time of invitation. Our Father in heaven, as we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in this time of prayer, I know that there is so much that we covered and it's only 13 verses. But it's your word and your word speaks. And I pray that each person here just got one thing from you. Maybe each person got the same thing, which is it takes a balance between knowledge and love to really live in the place of liberty properly. It takes knowledge with love to convey the truths of your word. I pray, God, by your spirit in this time of prayer that you will knock on the hearts of each one of us because all of us need to grow and need to grow up. I pray your blessing on our time in Jesus' name. Please stand.